Nikki Heath. I'm the national director for First Place for Health. But more important than that, I'm a friend of Ronell Johnson. And I just want to uh, encourage you, first of all, to listen with open heart and open ears to what he is gonna share with you tonight. Because how many of us have a wound? We all can, we can all raise our hand. So Mel, uh, he, Rin is married to Melissa and they have a beautiful family. They pastor together. Uh, Mel and Rin pastor together, but they're beautiful children. Uh, I've sat at the table with them at Sandy Cove, enjoyed our morning toast. They are a beautiful family. And this is another thing that I love about Ren. He is the real deal. That's so important today in every area of ministry. And I've read his book, Wounded But Winning, because Jesus promises, promises us the victory. And you... If you haven't bought this book already, buy it. You can get it from Ren's website at ronelljohnson.com. I hope he'll put a link up there so that you can get it and uh, let God use this in your life to start that healing and that victory that will come for you. So Ren, thank you for saying yes to the Lord the years that you wrote this book and for saying yes to coming on to our webinar. So, and Thank I'm saying bye-bye so I can watch. <laughs> Thank you, Vicki. Thank you so much. And Helen, thank you so much for having me uh, tonight. It's, I'm very blessed to be here, very honored to be here uh, for this uh, wonderful occasion. And it's good to see people here from literally all over the world and very excited to have this opportunity, opportunity to share with you. Um, I wrote this book a few years ago, uh, back in 2018 uh, through 19, uh, really is the story of my life. Um, I have been in church all of my life, born and raised in the church, and um, have been a believer of Jesus as long as I can remember. And, um, you know, there comes a point in your walk with the Lord where it stops being about what you learn, and it starts being about what you experience. You know, all of us have been through uh, Sunday school classes and uh, Bible studies, and we have gone through uh, different, uh, you know, classes about our walk with the Lord. But then it comes to a point when you start to experience life and you really, um, you really come into this place where you understand who Jesus is for yourself. And that's what this book is about. It's about my experience with Jesus. You know, we look through the Bible and we see different experiences. And I'm always so blessed about the Bible. One of the things I love about the Bible is that it doesn't hide weaknesses. You know, it's, it's not a book of perfection. It's not a book that simply talks about the good, uh, but it talks about our hero's struggles. It talks about problems. It talks about uh, issues. And I'm just so blessed um, that uh, when it comes to our walk with the Lord. I did want to do a little shout out right now for Sandy Cove. Uh, we actually met Pastor Ren through Sandy Cove, and he's actually prayed for us at our Restore Me retreat. So I want to just rem remind everyone, it is, it actually, if you tried to register for Sandy Cove and it wasn't available, uh, we talked to Sandy Cove today and they are taking reservations for May now over the phone. So um, our Sandy Cove is May 21st to the 23rd at Sandy Cove in Northeast Maryland. In the book, and my book starts out with talking about my experience of baby loss, you know, one of the things that, um, that, that um, is really important to me is my story about my child. Um, I have three beautiful children, Drew, Ava, and Peyton, who's being taken away from me now, uh, my youngest child. Um, and one of the things that I, I talk about in the book is the loss of our first child. My wife and I have been married for 12 years. Um, and, um, and very early on in our marriage, two years within our marriage, my wife got pregnant and we were so excited. This was 2012. We were so excited. We were pregnant and, you know, all of the feelings that come with having a brand new baby um, and everything was going fine. You know, we had been got to the four fifth month mark where we knew what the gender of the baby was going to be. It was a boy and we had gone through, um, you know, all of the sonograms and 
um, somewhere around the fifth month, um, the fifth or sixth month, um, I remember walking into the room and they were, they were analyzing my wife, just a regular checkup, a regular checkup. And all of a sudden, um, this, this really discouraged or disturbed expression came on the, the face of the nurse. And uh, I remember just looking at her and wondering what was wrong. And she said, you know, I, I, I'm not able to tell you what's wrong. And even that within itself was disturbing for me that she was unable to share with us what the problem was. She said, she said to us, you're going to have to hear it from a doctor. Um, and my wife just sitting there was, was just already in fear and there was so much tension. And the, what, the lady came in the room and she told us um, that looking at the sonogram, it seemed as if that our, our child was not going to be compatible with life. Those were the exact words that she used. Um, that the child would not be compatible with life. And all of a sudden, our whole life was flipped upside down. You know, uh, we had never been through anything like this before. Here we are, you know, I had already built the children's room, you know, had the room painted and got the uh, the baby crib and clothes. And I mean, you name it, it's the first child, right? You know, by the time you get to three or four children, you know, it's different. This is the first child, you know, everything we need, we have. And uh, I remember leaving the doctor's office that day and just driving home and the car was silent. I didn't know what to say to my wife. She didn't know what to say to me. Um, there was literally no hope left. You know, it wasn't one of those things where they were hoping that it might work out. They were very clear with us that our child was facing uh, severe hydrocephalus on the brain, water on the brain. Um, his heart was was beating outside of his chest. There were so many just different complications. And they were sure that not only would the child not survive, but there was going to be some suffering involved with this child. He's going to be struggling to, to uh, survive. Um, us being the believers we were, you know, we just tried to believe God and just believe God for a miracle. You know, we've all seen other stories and other testimonies of how God has been able to bless other children. You know, we did not believe in abortion. We did not believe in any of that. We're trusting God to do what he wanted to do. And it became an extremely difficult time for us. Um, and we learned in that moment a couple of things. One, how important it was to trust God. Because now we're not just talking about the God we learned. We're talking about the God that we are currently experiencing. And if I can have a true, if I can have an honest moment with you, I even had thoughts running through my mind of, well, God, why our child? You know, we're, we're faithful. We're, we're faithful to the ministry and we love you. We've served you. We've, we follow the word of God. You know, I remember there was a young lady in the church that I was going to at that time. And I hope this doesn't come off as judgmental because I'm, we're not, a, I'm not a judgmental person, but just so you understand the, 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 the issue I was having in my mind. There was a young lady in our church who I knew was was dealing with drug habits. I knew that she wasn't uh, just she was now on her seventh child, was not married. And for a second, for a split second, I'm trying to figure out how someone who is not following the traditional way of scripture are having all these healthy babies now on her seventh child. And my wife and I, who are following the word of God, have one child that we can't keep. That was, that was hard for us to accept that God would bless us with something and then take it away from, from us. Of course, there's precedent for this in the scripture when God says to Abraham, for example, give me your only son. He, he gave it to him and, and then asked to take it away from him. And, and uh, we're going through all these different emotional challenges. How, how are we going to deal with these, 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 uh, these issues we have or these problems we have trying to trust God, you know, and that seems so weird to say, but we were in a place where we were actually trying to trust God. And I don't know if I'm talking to anyone from where, wherever all over the world you are. If you've ever been in a place where you, when you're in, when you're in a situation where you're actually trying to trust God, it is easier said than done. It is easier said when you're dealing with pain, when you're dealing with current wounds, it, it, it's hard. It's difficult. And then, you know, people say, well, no, just, just trust God. You know, everything's going to be fine. That's good when you have healthy children. 
That's good when you have money in the bank. It's good when you know where your next meal is coming from. It's a different situation when you're dealing with a sick child. It's a different situation when you don't know where your next meal is coming from. It's a, it's a different situation when you're going through a divorce or you're going through a physical challenge or whatever it is. It's difficult. And we know the scripture, Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. But how do you trust God when you're dealing with a wound? There's something about pain that makes you, that, that can cause you to look at God differently. There's something about pain that makes you question everything you know. There's, there's a story in the Bible in Matthew chapter 11, I believe it is, when John the Baptist is in prison, right? Uh, he's in prison. And don't forget, this is the same John the Baptist who leaped in his mother's womb when he came into the same place that Jesus was within Mary's womb. They had a connection from birth. And uh, John, who is the forerunner of Jesus, spends years talking about this one that would come after him, who is actually preferred before him. They have this moment in Matthew chapter three, where John finally sees Jesus coming to the water. And he says, uh, this is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. If anyone knew who Jesus was, it was John the Baptist. Every scripture you see John the Baptist in, he is preaching uh, the, the message of repentance, but he's also preaching that one is coming after him, after him in terms of time, but before him in terms of he's, he's God man. He's coming after him and, he's, and he, John the Baptist knows who Jesus is. No one could ever question that John knew who Jesus was. But in Matthew chapter 11, John is sitting in a prison cell. He's about to be beheaded and his, his, John's disciples are sitting out the window and John says to his disciples, go and ask Jesus, are you he that should come or should we look for another? In other words, he asks him, go and ask Jesus if he's really who he says he is. Go and ask him if he's really the Messiah. Isn't it funny how John didn't question it when he was preaching the gospel? He never questioned it when he was baptizing countless number of people in the water. But as soon as he had uh, had to deal with pain, as soon as he had to deal with an issue, now he's questioning everything he knows. And it's just like you and I, that we know Jesus until we're wounded. We know him until we have to deal with pain. And pain will cause you to question everything you know about God. It doesn't mean that he's not God. It doesn't mean that he doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that he's still not a good God. But there's something about wounds that will make you question even the very existence of God. Does God exist? Because how can God exist and see me suffer this way? How can God exist? We, they tell me he's a loving God. But I feel so far from love. Sometimes I wonder if it's really true. Is God really with me? Wounds have a way of having us question our faith in God. And this is where we were. This is where my wife and I were when it came to our relationship with God. We loved God. We'd served God all of our life. Our parents loved God. We were raised to love Jesus. But there's something about pain. There's something about wounds. And there's something about loss that will, that will make you question everything you know. And we had to make a decision. Are we going to walk by faith? Or are we going to walk by sight? Are we going to believe God? Or are we going to believe what we see? Long story short, my friends, uh, it was just maybe another month. It was December 12th, 2012 at 11, 11 p.m. that my son would give his final breath. He was born and he would die shortly after. So this story does not end well. You know, I don't have that testimony of uh, God spared my child's life and all is well, and thank God, and I, I trust him, and I love him. We had to learn to trust God losing our child. It's one thing to trust God when, when he does what we ask him to do, but can you still trust him if your prayer is not answered? I had to learn that God did not punish me with loss. He trusted me with loss. 
that God did not punish me with wounds. He trusted me that while wounded, I will keep preaching the gospel. He did not punish me with hurt. He trusted me with hurt. He trusted that while I was hurt, I wouldn't disconnect myself from the message of the cross. And so we have to learn in that moment that God is still with us. It was, it was, it was, it was not too long after that incident, after that, that challenge, that, of course, God blessed my family. Uh, we were told at that time that we wouldn't be able to have more children. I remember sitting in the office. We went back to John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore and sat down with the, with the doctors. And they said that they didn't believe that we would have any more children. Well, I have three children today, three beautiful children. Uh, Drew, who is nine years old, my daughter, who is um, seven years old, Ava, and my youngest child, who you heard screaming a few minutes ago. You have to keep her in prayer. Uh, that's Peyton, who is uh, two years old. So God has blessed our family. But my friends, I'll tell you this. If we were sitting here today with no children, we would still trust God. Because trusting God has nothing to do with him answering your prayer. You see, we have, we have at times, unfortunately, manipulated the purpose of prayer. We have gone to God about what we need. And the Bible says that we should do that, right? I'm not against us going to God about what we need. But maturity in prayer says that we go to God to find out what he needs. What does he want from us? That's where my prayer life is now. It's, it's not God, can you do this? It's God, what do you need me to do? What do you need me to know? How can I best serve you? And during that time, you know, we had, we had uh, when we lost our child, there was a brief moment between that child loss and having another child where we had to learn to trust God again. What are we going to do? Which way are we going to go? How are we going to operate from here? So many questions went through our mind. And during that time, that was 2012, the end of 2012. 2013 was one of those transitional years for us. We were trying to figure out who we are and what God was calling us to do. And during that time, I remember the Lord spoke to me about healing others, about writing a book and, and speaking to others about our journey of, of wounds and our journey of pain and to literally show our wounds. I encourage you, my brothers and sisters, that showing your wounds is a part of your process. Jesus did it in, in John chapter 20. The Bible says that uh, the disciples were assembled together for fear of the Jews. He had already risen from the dead. And the Bible said that Jesus came into the room and they wouldn't believe that it was him until he showed them his wounds. There's something about showing your wounds that identifies you with other people. And so the Bible said that he pulled his robe back and he showed the wounds of his hands. He showed the wounds of his feet. He showed the, uh, the, the wound in his side. And somebody, Thomas, we call him Doubting Thomas, believed that it was him based on Jesus showing him his wounds. And I believe this is the season where God wants us to be open and honest about some of the things that we've been through. The very stories that we hide are the stories that we need to share because as we, share, as we show our wounds, here's the beautiful thing about showing your wounds. Your wound is not just a sign that you were hurt. Your wound is also a sign that you survived. I'll say that again. Your wound is not just a sign that you hurt at one point. Your wound is also a sign that you survived. Even if there's times that you still deal with the trauma of it, you survived it. And at some point, I do believe that God brings us to a place where um, our hearts begin to mend. Our hearts begin to get, it, it, it gets to a better place at some point. One of the scriptures I love in the Bible is in 2 Kings, where the Bible says that there were a couple of lepers that were sitting outside the gate because they were dealing with leprosy. And one of the things that really blesses me about that scripture is the fact that one of them said, why sit here until we die? I remember being in that place in 2013 where I had to ask myself, how long am I going to sit in my pain? How long am I going to keep rehearsing the trauma of my past? How long am I going to keep uh, repeating the same cycle of, of, of uh, 
whatever issue I may be going through. Maybe, maybe some people on here have gone through divorce or have gone through child loss like I did, or have gone through health challenges or have lost a parent. Um, you know, there was a time in my life and I, I share this in my book also, uh, one of the times in my life that was, was, uh, uh, really, uh, something that came up recently when I say recently in the last 10 years, um, I was molested as a child and it's something that I had put away in my mind for years. It's something that I had never even spoken about, um, and just gotten on with my life. And not too long ago, uh, a family member of mine um, was going through a difficult time and had gone through some challenges psychologically and um, has shared with my mother that they had been molested by this family member. And when I heard that story, um, all of these feelings flooded my mind, flooded my heart, flooded my spirit. Because now, as a grown man in my 30s, I had to deal with a challenge that I had unintentionally suppressed in the back of my mind, had not thought about it. And so now I had to make a decision whether it was worth, again, showing my wounds. This was not something that uh, I had ever shared with anybody. And I'll be honest with you, my friends, I hadn't even at that time shared with my wife. And I didn't not share it with her because it was a secret. I did not share it with her because I had so far suppressed it that in my mind and in my spirit, it almost never happened. It, it was not a story for me to tell because it, it never happened until my mother told me about another family member. Then all these memories and all these feelings came flooding back. And I had to make a decision whether I was going to remain in the dark about what happened or whether I was going to share. And I decided in that moment to show my wounds. I decided in that moment that it was, it was healthier for me. It was healthier for my family to share what had happened to me. Now I'll share this with you. As I shared the story with my wife and, and shared it with my, uh, my mom and what had happened to me, and this, this same family member that the victim, my family member victim was talking about, this same family member had also molested me as a child. One of the things that I had to deal with was the fact that this family member denied it ever happening. I have fond, me I have vivid memories. I know what I'm saying is true. Um, I wouldn't just make something like that up. I know this person wouldn't make something like that up. And this person denied it. And again, I'm in this place of uh, dealing with a wound that I can't seem to close. Because how do you close a wound when, when the person denies that it ever happened? How do you close a wound without an apology? And the Lord spoke to me. I remember, the, I, remember I, was, I was praying one night and I truly believe the Lord spoke to me. And he said, um, he said to me that you're dealing with somebody who has capacity issues. You're never going to receive an apology and you have to be okay with moving on without an apology. There may be some people on this call tonight who can't heal until somebody apologizes. I'm telling you, and I hope I'm encouraging you tonight. There are some people in our life that will never apologize. There are some people in our life, you, you, can't, you can't allow them to hold your healing hostage by waiting years and decades for an apology that will never come. There are people who will pass away and never apologize. You, you've got to get to a place where, you, where, you, uh, where you're able to move on without an apology, where you're able to be who God has called you to become without an apology. My father um, abandoned us as a child. We did not grow up together. Uh, my dad was not there. And I had to make a decision about my father who wanted to be in my life as an adult. Do I, do I hold it against him? Do I say, hey, you know, where were you all of my life? Um, and I'll share this with you. Forgive me for standing up for a second. I didn't mean to do this, but I want to share this with you. I, um, I had to make a decision whether I would forgive him or not. And a few years ago, uh, well, I, I did. I, I prayed about it and decided that I was going to forgive my father. I can't go back and relive the abandonment 
But what I can do is start here. Start here right now, a relationship with my father. This picture, and I'm closing shortly. This picture is one of my favorite pictures. I hope you can see it. This picture is a picture of my father, me, and my son. This is a picture of healing. It's in my office. I'm sitting in my office now. And this picture is a consistent reminder of what it looks like to forgive without an apology. My father, up to this day, March 13th, 2023, my father to this day has never apologized. I honestly don't think he knows how to apologize. I don't think he has the capacity. You know, I preached a message uh, not too long ago about the time that Mary and Joseph is pregnant with Jesus and they go to the inn and they're looking for room in the inn. And the Bible says that there's no room in the inn. And uh, the message I preached was called capacity problems. There are some people that just don't have the capacity to love you the way you need to be loved. Can I say that again? There's some people that just don't have the capacity to love you the way you need to be loved. And here we are. We can't hate the innkeeper. We're not taking in Mary and Joseph. They just don't have the capacity. And there are some people in your life that unfortunately, they're just incapable of loving you the way you need to be loved. I have come to the conclusion that my father could not love me the way I needed to be loved. And so I had to learn to love him without, uh, without needing that apology. And when I came to a place of, of finally loving him the way that I'm supposed to love him, we were able to heal. But it takes you being in that place that says, how long are we going to sit here until we die? How long are we going to keep repeating the issues of old? How long are we going to keep uh, rehashing old wounds? Or at some point, are we going to heal? It's a capacity issue. Some people do not have the capacity. And we've got to learn to forgive people who just don't have the capacity to love us on our level. And if you're able to to forgive them for not having the capacity to love them on the level that you need love, guess what you can do? You can finally move on and have a strong relationship. I no longer need an apology from my dad. I just need a phone call. You know, I went to England last year, spent two weeks with my father, had a great time. That I, I love my relationship with my father today. I love it. N never had an apology. I don't need it anymore. I'm good. And I'm, I'm, my prayer for you tonight, and I'm coming to my close, my prayer for you tonight is that you can learn to move on without an apology. That you can learn to heal and allow those wounds to close up without having the apology and without requiring the capacity of people that they just don't have. Can I remind you that Jesus was still born without needing the end? He, he didn't need the room in the end. They didn't have the capacity, yet his purpose was still fulfilled. So you don't need, uh, the, the, you don't need them to, to get to where they need to get to in order for you to be everything that God has called you to be. So my encouragement to you tonight is to know that you can still win even if you have wounds. Helen, can I pray for everyone before we close up? Is that okay with you? Okay, let me go ahead and pray and, and close tonight. Father, we are so thankful. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this opportunity to share with these, your brothers and sisters tonight, my brothers and sisters, your sons and daughters. Um, I pray that I've said something that has strengthened them, uh, that, it, that have healed them, that have Bless them tonight. Lord, I pray that I've said something to uh, allow them to be able to move on from the trauma and move on from the pain and move on from the hurt. I thank you, Lord, that you are, you are allowing us to move beyond the hurt and beyond the wounds. I ask you, Lord, just like you did with Thomas, uh, that we would not be afraid to show our wounds and show where we've come from and show what we've gone through that we might become everything you want us to be. Our purpose is not attached to anyone that's left us. Our purpose is not connected to anyone, God, who abandoned us. 
Lord, our purpose is connected to you. You placed us on the earth. So help us to fulfill our God-given assignment. Regardless of what happened to us, we thank you that all things are working together for our good. And we give your name praise today. Bless one and bless all. Thank you for this opportunity. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wow. That is so good. I just love that capacity one. That is hits me right where I need to. I heard that. Let's just say I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm going to be saying, I'll just say the word capacity whenever I get hurt by that person. I'll just say mm, <laughs> capacity, capacity. Right. Uh, so before uh, we're going to take questions, I already have one. If you have any questions for Pastor Ren, go to that Q&A and start typing away. All right. First question I have for you, Pastor Ren, is how does one handle in prayer, et cetera, a situation where you are still in the place amongst the one who has spiritually wounded you? Wow. Wow. That's a that's a great question. Um, the only way I can answer that is the same way that Jesus did it. You know, uh, one of the examples we have is when Jesus is on the cross, <laughs> he's on the cross and he is, uh, literally in the middle of being wounded. He is, he has been crucified. And one of the seven last sayings that Jesus utters out of his mouth is father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Um, I think it's a very powerful scripture uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, because one, it was clear that Jesus did not deserve to be wounded. It was clear that Jesus had the power to come off the cross if he wanted to. Um, but he stayed because he knew his purpose was greater than his pain. But when you talk about how do you forgive the person, one, you do what Jesus did. Father, forgive them. You go back to the Father. You go back to him and you ask him to help you forgive that person. You know, there's a very powerful scripture. I believe it's in Luke 17. Uh, Luke 17, around the fifth verse. Um, I laugh every time I, I read this scripture because I think it's a powerful scripture. Uh, Jesus is speaking to his disciples about forgiveness. And he says to them, he says that, you know, he, he goes through the whole thing about forgiving 70 times seven, which is 490 times, all, that, all those different things. Now we know, you know, we talk about forgiving seven, 70 times seven. That's in one day, by the way. We're supposed to forgive 490 times in one day. I never forget one person that asked me, they said, well, pastor, if we get to 491, can I finally let them have it? And I said, listen, if you get to 491, you know, I, it's, that's between you and God. <laughs> but the point that Jesus is making, of course, is that no matter how many times someone needs forgive it, forgiveness, you give it to them. That's the key here. It's not so much the number. You give it to them. But when they heard Jesus talk about forg forgiveness, Luke 17 and verse 5 says, Lord, increase our faith. Have you ever noticed they did not ask for an increase of faith when they saw the woman heal with the issue of blood? They did not ask for an increase of faith when he fed the 5,000. They did not ask for an increase of faith when Lazarus was raised from the dead. But when Jesus said, you have to forgive, they said, Lord, increase our faith. This mm -hmm. teaches us that it takes faith to forgive. If you're struggling to forgive, put that on the altar too. I say, Lord, give me the faith to forgive this person. I don't have the, we don't have the capacity all the time to forgive. So I'm going to put, just like I put everything else on the altar, put unforgiveness on the altar. He said, Lord, increase our faith. And I believe that if you pray for an increase of faith, even if you're among the person who hurt you, you may have to live with them, whether it's a, you know, a spouse or a pastor or whoever it may be, a, a trusted person in your church. Um, ask for an increase of faith. That's what the disciples did. And I believe that God will bless you. I think that that answer also goes to the second question without going into detail. How do you forgive the person who hurt you as a child and denies it happened? Mm. Um, it says only by the Holy spirit, you said faith sounds like you yes. did. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it, it, it really is. I, and I think, um, 
you know, that last part only by the Holy Spirit is true. And I, I, I never want to come off as, you know, being so deep, but it, it really is the answer. It is literally by the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't have, we don't have the, the strength to forgive. There's some people who have literally run out of all energy as it become, as it pertains to certain situations. We don't have the mental capacity or the emotional capacity to handle some things that we're going through. And that's where we rely on the Holy Spirit to allow us to get over certain things, again, without an apology. You don't need an apology to heal. And to be in the place where you don't need an apology to heal is gonna take the power of the Holy Spirit. It's gonna take an increase of faith. So going to God on that behalf, I think will certainly help us. Thank you. All right, so there's a couple, I know the answer, uh, you can tell it though. How, what's the name of your book and how do they buy it? Wounded But Winning is available on Amazon. Uh, you can go to Amazon and type in my name, Rennell Johnson, and the book Wounded But Winning, and it's available there. Or you can go to my website, which is rennelljohnson.com, and you can order your book there. Either way is fine with me, whichever way you want to go. Um, it is on Prime, so if you want it quicker, you can definitely get it on Amazon, and you'll get it the next day. Or if you, can, or if you want to order it on my website, you can also do that. And then someone wants to know, how do they get you to speak at their church? Well, thank you. I so appreciate you even asking that question. Uh, you can go again to our website at renelljohnson.com. Um, and on there, there is a booking form that you can fill out. And uh, my administrative assistant, who I think I saw her in the chat, she's here. Uh, she'll respond to you as soon as possible. Um, or the other way you can do it is to uh, find me on Facebook or on Instagram. It's under my name, Rennell Johnson. And just inbox me. I'll get you connected to our admin. Or on, um, or on Instagram, which is Rennell Johnson. Again, my first and last name. And uh, if you inbox me there, I'll get you connected to our team. And I would be most honored to come and speak at your church. So thank you so much for the consideration. I thought that was great. I do want to just go back to that whole capacity issue. I'm, I think there's somebody in my life. And like I said, I think I'm going to just keep saying capacity yeah. probably for the rest of their lives anyway you know they're a little older than me but yeah. you know i'm thinking i'll just keep thinking pastor ren said capacity lord help like <laughs> capacity yes. so i think it's i think it's a forgiveness thing forever when mm. they're alive still that's how i at least i experience it that yes. way it's a forgiveness thing it's a forever forgiveness thing and mm. sometimes we get a little weary of it at least yeah. I do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and I, and Helen, I totally understand that, you know, even dealing with the forever forgiveness part, the way that I, at least for me, how it works for me is for me to always remember that someone is having to forever forgive me. You know, I think mm -hmm. oftentimes we forget that we have hurt people and, um, you know, as I've, I've made someone the victim and they may be forever forgiving me and I want to be forever forgiven. I don't want to hold anybody hostage. And for me, rem remembering that, that Christ um, has forever forgiven me and there are people that may need to forever forgive me helps me to be able to forgive somebody else. Forgive uh, as we are forgiven, you know, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go back to a couple more cool things to share. And that is, in case you haven't heard, My Place to Race starts on next Monday, the 20th. It is a fundraiser for first place, but it's a 40-day fitness challenge that starts on the 20th, which is the first day of spring, everybody. Did you know that next Monday is the first day of spring? And it runs for 40 days through April 28th. And um, we're all going to be doing our virtual racing together. So if you, um, it is, you, it's real easy. You just go to www.myplacetorace.com. Uh, I'm typing as fast as I can and talking. And that is where you go to sign up. And um, Vicki and I, we, a whole bunch of us have teams. So if you want to be on a team, just let us know. Um, see, Vicki already put her, her, her passcode is Edisto Fit. And that I believe is also Edisto Fit is her password. Mine is Wellness Warriors Barada. And my password is FP for H, the first place for health acronym. But there's other people out here too. So come join us and be on the race. 
I also want to invite you into, if you haven't heard of our inner circle, it is our new subscription place. Come be in the inner circle first place where you get a weekly tax, prayer text, a recipe, healthy recipe text. You get scripture to music. Um, and we have a weekly wrap up. And um, every three weeks we have a menu plan that gives you a day of all healthy menus. And then um, we're going to have our first, uh, if you're already in, our first Zoom meetup is on March 24th at 1130 a.m. Central Time. And that's in your weekly email. So if you haven't noticed that, it's in the weekly inner, inner circle email about our meetup. So the inner circle is just a way that you can support first place, but we want to support you in your wellness journey. So I think you got it all. We have the uh, restore me, which goes right with our topic. So if this today's topic just really, you know, home to be restore me, it is a great place. And Sandy Cove, oh, Sandy Cove is just such a place to go you know, anointed by the, just come and just be it <laughs> with us. And then, um, and then join us on the, my place to race and then the inner circle. All right. I see we have another question. Let me see. Um, this person says, I may have missed it for a few minutes, but do you still advocate that we go to the person who hurt us and tell them how they hurt us first? Wouldn't this give them an opportunity to ask for forgiveness? Yeah, this is a great question. Matthew 18 um, speaks about this, that if we have ought against our brother or if there's someone that has done something to us, um, that we should go to them. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's very scriptural that we should go to them. Um, now that, that the, the, the scripture speaks specifically about leaving our gift at the altar. So it's speaking about ministry, right? That if you're gonna be in ministry, that you need to be able to make sure that you minister from a, from a, a pure place, from a clear mind. And so going to these people and fixing these issues uh, is really important. Um, but from a from an emotional standpoint, from a psychological standpoint, um, there are some people who you can go to who don't want to hear it. I just don't want us to ever be in a place where we think a conversation will fix everything. Um, you can only have a conversation, and I'm going to use this word again, you can only have a conversation with those who have the capacity for conversation. There are some people who don't have the capacity to have a conversation. And this is where we learn to forgive without an apology. Of course, um, I advocate for um, going to that person, having a conversation. And there are people who will hear you. And there are people who will ask for forgiveness. There are people who hurt you who don't, who don't even know they hurt you. You know, I, I remember as a pastor, our church is growing. I have three churches and our church is growing. And I remember somebody was hurt by the fact that I didn't hug them that day. And um, I didn't know. I didn't know, you know, with, with our church growing, I cannot hug everybody. It was important to that person. And uh, I, I told him, I said, listen, I, I wasn't ignoring you. I simply just didn't just didn't catch you that Sunday. Um, and so I do think it's important to have conversations with people that have the capacity. But if they don't have the capacity, um, mm -hmm. then take it to God. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Trust God to be able to heal your heart with those that don't have the capacity to hear you or ask for forgiveness.